Hello. Hello, Hello everybody. Good to see you. <laughs> you might take your time to um, check everybody and saying hello to everybody on all the pages. Yay. Mm, Mia's baby. Oh. And it's good to be here with, you know, everyone but Darine. She's, I don't know if, I guess Jesse announced it last week, but I'm not going up to, um, Canada to teach because of this body stuff and Jesse's going in my place. Steve is up there from Thailand and Doreen is up there. So it's um, how it is. <laughs> so if you see me moving a lot, stillness, stillness is not my friend right now. So um, I apologize if it's distracting and uh, yeah. So we'll start up. Um, I might try sitting for a few minutes. Oh, I give some instruction. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a treat to see you all. I'm kind of happily stunned. <laughs> I'm gonna look again. I okay. Hmm. Hmm. So our fathom long body with all the six sense doors. So let's just kind of let the attention settle in within our bodies, within our six sense doors. And a lot of the practice, as we know, is taking the time to slow down and relax, to receive a few moments of our experience, just as it is, without that tendency. It's like a habit of making what's appearing into something familiar and habitual conditioned. So it's kind of like we're unsticking the mind, the attention from habit. And we don't really have to think about that. The best part of this is that we just check in, for example, right now, with any sounds that are happening and including silence, of course, as there is often even sometimes a subtle texture and vibration to what we would call silence. And, and this is again, very simple. It's like, we just try to receive just what is apparent. We don't have to try too hard. A very light whisper in the mind of hearing once in a while to bring us back. And it's really just, again, making the space and time to allow ourselves to drop into a more non-conceptual awareness as best we can. 
So the word rain or car, bird, person speaking, whatever sounds are happening. You allow the thoughts about the sound to come and go. It's just thinking, coming and going. But then you just let the attention settle into that movement of sound just as it's happening. And often we need to bring in some gentleness and kindness or tenderness to match the tenderness of how fleeting and quickly reality is appearing and disappearing. So we can gently bring our attention to our hands. With ease, no hurry. Notice gently the visual images that come when we connect there. and just let them be. And letting the awareness relax into the sensations that are happening there moment by moment, the non-visual sensation. can be just very light pressure or warmth or cold, cool, tingling, heaviness, or no words. So we're often in the instructions going faster than you need to be going with this. But often as we settle into our hands, the sounds, sensations of hands, Sometimes it'll feel more inviting to let the attention settle more inside our body with the movement of the breath. See if you can let it be more like a invitation. It's like just receiving some moments of wind touching your cheek. We get a sense of the tenderness necessary to receive air coming and going by itself.
It's very calming to just see if we can catch that wave of air as it moves and disappears. It also invites us into insight, just the nature of how things are. What appears will disappear. It's not mine. Not me or I. And sometimes if the attention is wandering, it can be helpful to go to hands or sound, of course. And of course, with that, there is that way in which it has a whiff of friendship with ourselves. Mostly it's just us chattering, talking with ourselves. We just need to understand that. In the meditation, the formal meditation, we tend to listen to the thinking. Mostly that way. And attending, attending to sounds, breath, and body sensation. As much as we can, as more of the foreground of our experience. but caring for ourselves, caring for the thoughts, having metta for the thoughts. Just part of us trying to connect with us, another part of it, it's okay. Just thinking coming and going by itself, no problem. And if there's any unattended emotion that are appearing, that are kind of fueling the thoughts, you don't have to look for them or dig them out. Sometimes it's just fueling the planning, the remembering, or the anxiety or grief, anger, loneliness, etc. We do our best to connect just like we would with sound or hand.
the language of emotion, compassion, happiness, peace, fear. Letting the attention anchor with our body sensation, breath, hands. with great care as the emotion passes through. Again, just like the wind or clouds. They're not me or I or mine. Just being just with what is moment by moment.
Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Well, I wanted to offer a talk that um, honored Earth Day yesterday. I think one day of Earth Day might not be enough <laughs> anymore. Maybe we need a few more Earth Days. Um, and also um, hearing from the Vancouver people about the rain. Um, also, I wanted to offer a bit more about water on the planet in honor of Earth Day. And, you know, um, Steve and Jesse have been telling me about the rain in Vancouver, and we had more rain here this year, thankfully. Um, so we'll start with water. And uh, the reminder that our bodies are made up of so much water. But often it's the element that we're the least in touch with inside our bodies. I think only when we're drinking water maybe that we feel feel it but often it's it's like it's it's said that water holds the other elements together so if you have a sense of being held by your body it's not just your bones or the earth element air element holding of course and temperature but water is a, a huge aspect of our bodies and the planet uh, and so we need it so much uh, and because it was um Thankfully, living in the desert a little bit more rainy this this um, during my self retreat. I know that you know that I love to practice with puddles. Uh, partly, it's probably because they're so rare, but also I find them so contained, and it's because they're so contained compared to even a, a small pond where you know where I grew up. There were a lot of little ponds and a lake. Um, I find them great teachers. And one, um, one part of my practice period, I was really noticing how um, a puddle doesn't happen except drop by drop. And just like the ocean, right? Like it's like, or it's like, um, we don't always take the time to really notice a puddle form. But that day I was particularly interested in watching this puddle grow and uh, taking a lot of time there. And it was reminding me of the practice of metta. Also all of the practice, whether it's karuna or mindfulness or whatever, but just that sense of how it really will be very invisible how we start shifting into being able to access more genuine loving kindness or access more genuine whatever karuna or mindfulness. But it's like, it's so invisible, but it actually can be very palpable. Like the truth can be invisible, but there's a very palpable way that we see it manifesting, emerging out of the unconditioned, uh, And, and so with loving kindness, uh, I think we can be very, for example, impatient with how it isn't as accessible maybe as we want, especially with difficult people or difficult ourselves or difficult uh, politics or whatever. And I think it's really important to remember that um, babies will die if they don't, sorry, <coughs> if they don't. <coughs> Babies will die if they don't get enough metta. And in a living in a desert, 
plants die if they don't get enough water, right? And we will die, and the earth who needs it. And that, so it's that sense of like, yes, um, the Dhamma unfolding, the truth unfolding can be invisible, but there's very palpable ways that we can notice when we can be kind. Yeah. Or when we can't. And that to have the ability to get, oh, it's like, <laughs> to me, it's like the puddle. Like, it's just like, okay, little drops, little drops. And then it might not, that puddle is the same puddle, right? The same place and t- space and time that I visit um, down my driveway, down the road. <laughs> and it's like, a lot of the time it isn't there. And one day, um, the day that I'm, particularly talking about where I was seeing the filling up of the puddle, like the filling up of ourselves with loving kindness and the filling up of metta to the point where we can wish all beings metta, kindness, well, unconditionally, without conditions. So this is a haiku I wrote. One drop of metta drop by drop, makes a puddle. And then the cars drive through. Because that's what happened. I mean, you know, my neighbors don't know that I'm standing there very quiet for forever, long time. And like this car just, I was having this great experience of metta and insight. And then this car just drove through the puddle. I was like, Wow, you know, without Vipassana practice, without insight, you know, it's a rough, rough business, yeah. And then another one drove through and another one drove through and I was like, okay, you know, it takes time to watch the puddle evaporate, but I decided not to (laughs) that day. Um, But it's just things come and go. And to remember just even snowflakes, enough snowflakes will end a drought. You know, and I'm meaning this internally as well as externally. Enough water, you know, and and just tears, tears of laughter, tears of sadness. It's like that, that's the sense of how important water is for all of us, how it manifests, how it's hidden um, in regard especially to metta. And to really, really understand that it's okay when we can't do it, when we can't manifest it. That it's a form of metta to understand that sometimes we just can't access it. It's okay. Because we know by practicing long enough, we know that we will be able to again and to value it, to value that, to value that um, sometimes it's a real drought. I realize by getting to stay home right now rather than travel north in the spring that I realize that spring is actually the most um, lush time in where I live in the desert in Hawaii because eventually it gets so hot and the the bugs come with all the plants and, you know, it's like dry and... um, it really starts to get just brown, brown, gray, gray. And so it's it's very um, lush right now and for a desert, right? And um, I, I heard that California, there's some parts of it that they had atmospheric rivers. I haven't read the news yet, but I'm re- hearing little things. And just like the wildflowers are just crazy, like just bountiful. And uh, this morning, it had rained, and uh, I picked a yellow rose and brought it in, and there were all these raindrops on it. So I took a picture of it, and I sent it to uh, a woman that I've also mentioned a lot. Uh, she's 86 years old. She's a na- neighbor from my childhood. Um, 
And she had written me this morning that she really wishes that she had more joy every day. She said that um, there are just mon many moments where she doesn't want to cook, and she doesn't want to do housework, and she doesn't want to do chores, and she doesn't <laughs> want to do laundry. And she, she wrote all this. She doesn't want to go shopping, and she doesn't want to <laughs> look for gluten-free bread, and she, <laughs> and she doesn't want all this body paint. It was this really long text. And I was like, I love, I love her because she's so honest. You know, she's 86. Um, you know, and how often do we feel this way, right? And that we we wish we were feeling joyful doing the dishes, right? But we're actually not, right? And so there's this, she said, I feel like I'm not joyful enough even though I plan to be, right? 86, she's thought, she thought it would be different. And how how is that for us? It's like when we have this idea again and again of like, oh, it, it should be, I should be like this versus how is it, you know? And often, if you look, it's, it's often very neutral or it's, uh, it's unpleasant. It's because it's neutral and unpleasant and we're just not able to get there for that, that it's okay. So I noticed um, when I sent the flower that now I don't, re I rarely do this very once in a while, but I will mention, I'm hoping nobody's on a deep retreat where I'm mentioning a song because the song, Raindrops on Roses, uh, you know this song? And um, I'm going to read one paragraph of it. Rain, I'm not going to sing it. Come on, Michelle, don't sing. Raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens, brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. And then, of course, it goes on and on with that. And then at the end, it's like when the dog bites, when the bee stings, when I'm feeling sad. I simply remember my favorite things, and then I don't feel so bad. Now, where I grew up as a kid, you didn't sing the song out loud. I mean, you would just be pounced on. Like, you just had to be in despair. Like, you know, it was just like, or, you know, tough. Like, this was not a song that you could even pretend you liked or you'd get <laughs> trashed. Um, but so I kind of took that in as a kid um, and um, had this idea of it as being more of a Pollyanna song, but it was only a defense for myself because I actually did feel happy when I heard that song and it made me feel good, but it was like this layer of resistance that protected me. Um, and when I learned the metta practice and started to get a taste of what was genuine, you know, what was really real with it, that it was not picking and choosing when to feel kind toward yourself or others. Like it, it included pain, neutral pleasure. It included metta, being kind, included all experience and without conditions to be able to be kind. I could see that, that there was a kind of Pollyanna, Pollyanna metta that where I grew up, there was a, um, a defiance of that that was protective, but also really sad because that one couldn't take in the goodness of one's favorite things. And um, there is a, a great musician, John Coltrane, uh, who's no longer alive, but he took that song and to me, he perfected it. It was like, a kind of um, digging deep that comes through, a digging deep through all that range of joy and sorrow to this like beautiful kind of defiant joy that like included every, all pain, all pleasure. And um, I think that that's so important that 
we um, you wouldn't say that chronic pain, for example, I wouldn't say that right now, is my favorite thing, <laughs> like at all. But I think that being able to include that with kindness and metta is essential. And I think uh, when things are hard, being able to see raindrops and roses is the only way we often get through. And that's what I think can allow us to dig deep in rough times, you know, that it's so important to have um, that access to something beautiful like cat's whiskers. And I think I might have mentioned this at the beginning of my retreat, but um, actually Jesse had bought me a plant at a little uh, farmer's market that he didn't know what it was. And the lady who was selling the plants, she didn't know what it was. And I put it in the ground and it's called a cat's whiskers. Did I mention this before? It is so incredible. Now I have, like they've multiplied and um, each like little long whisker on the plant, on the flowers is like a head of flowers and little, each at the end of each whisker is like this purple color. So it's like each whisker was dipped in purple paint. And um, it has brought me so much joy during, um, you know, some pretty intense chronic <laughs> pain. So I think that um, I, I wanted to make sure when I talked about this, that it, it uh, Without the joy and the beauty, um, often we can't get through the sorrow. And it's considered to be an important aspect of being human and why it's like easier for us to practice. Like for, if you're in a hell realm where it's always unpleasant and always painful, it's hard to get out. And it's said often that it's only metta that gets us out. And the Buddha taught that the human world has this mix of pleasure and pain and neutral, and that that's why it's such a the best place to practice. It's such a rich place to practice because we can open to it all, but not get stuck. We're not meant to get stuck like in the heaven realms <laughs> that you can get attached to the pleasure of the metta, just like the puddle, right? You're all feeling all good from the metta but the love, but there isn't any wisdom to hold that the car is just about to plow through and destroy the puddle. Yeah, all conditioned things, everything conditioned is arising and passing away. Understanding this brings the greatest kind of happiness, which is peace. So that peace with how things are is liberation. So moving more into that, I um, also have mentioned this story, I think many times in a way, but um, this retreat brought it back. And uh, my second retreat in my life, way back, <laughs> mid 70s, um, uh, the teacher talked about when he was a monk um, for long years, right after when he disrobed, he was um, invited to New York City and to meet with this woman who'd been in an iron lung most of her life. And I think that it's only when you've really, <laughs> really done a lot of long practice where you get a sense of like, you get a whiff of what that might be like. You, you don't know what it's like, but you get a sense of what it must be like. You can empathize really deeply with that level of <sighs> hardship in a lot, iron lung most of her life. And he was brought in to kind of try to be of comfort and help for her. But when he 
was brought in and got a sense of what was happening, he just broke down and he said, how, how could you do this? How could you even stand this? And he cried and just, how did you do this? And, um, I'm going to take time with this because it's so important. She said, uh, every once in a while, now this is so important, every once in a while, every once in a while a nurse comes into the room and every once in a while a nurse will open the window. And every once in a while a breeze will come into the room from the window. And every once in a while, a breeze will tell me everything I need to know because it's touched my cheek. And to me, that's so it. It's like we want the experience to yield so much. It is this constant demand of the experience to yield what we want and what we want and what we want to make us happy, to make us joyful. And it can't. It can't. And, and it's that expectation and agenda and that unwillingness to go through not getting what we want. So that every once in a while is everything. When you listen to that, like how many times did she actually have a breeze come through the window and touch her cheek and tell her everything she needed to know? But that's all of us. And I want to say this to my friend, right? Like, like that, oh, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah, we plan for, we want more joy, but actually it just doesn't happen. <laughs> it takes so much willingness and time to go through when we're not experiencing joy. And for that to be okay. And I'm not going to go into my, my particular situation. This talk, I'll be on the sitting, the next Sunday sitting, the next two Sunday sittings, um, because Steve and Jarene and Jesse are going to be teaching at Hollyhock. Um, but I will say that I ended up having to be on the floor a lot. I, I still do. And um, I would put my little mat by a window and it was very similar to that story I would lay down and sometimes the wind would blow the curtain into my face and I would either have to get up and do all this stuff to block it or I would just let the curtain keep touching my <laughs> cheek and feel the wind with the curtain and it was so it was just, that's probably why I'm talking about this because it was so moving to me just like that memory of that story and that woman and uh, just to be able to receive that that with that level of delicacy and gentleness is so important and got me through that level of sensitivity that often the world doesn't value. It really makes space for the Brahma Viharas and insight and liberation. And this was a um, poem that I really found helpful, this retreat. I'll probably read it a lot this next year. <laughs> it's from Dogen, Dogen Zenji, who lived uh, 26th of January, 1200 to the 
September 22nd, 1253. He was the founder of the Soto, Soto School of Zen in Japan. Treading along, even that first line, treading along in this dreamlike, illusory realm without looking for the traces I may have left. A cuckoo song beckons me to return home. Hearing this, I tilt my head to see who has told me to turn back? But do not ask me where I am going as I travel in this limitless world where every step I take is my home. Boy, I hope this for all of us, that we really can leave nostalgia, the belief in nostalgia. We just let it be, don't fall for it. Any past moment that we cling to, anything we want in the future or try to avoid from the past and the future, any expectation, agenda, all the nostalgia keeps us from this, where every step is our home, every step in the grocery store, in the hospital, in the bathroom, right? Every step is our home. It's just a matter of our attitude. It's that simple. It's amazing. So don't let too much turn your head. <laughs> to turn you back. May you be, may we be peaceful and content in heart, kind, compassionate, joyful, and peaceful. Thank you, Jesse, for hosting, and thank you for your teaching. Thank you, Stephen, for coming. I know it's, it's been a lot for all of us to kind of hold this change and bring it all into manifestation. So um, we'll see you Sunday. Lots of love. If you want to... Listen to John Coltrane's version oh. of my favorite things. I put a little <laughs> bit. Oh boy. In the chat. I highly recommend it. <laughs> hmm.